Welcome to the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, for generations now, America's universities, national laboratories, and innovative companies have fueled the technology breakthroughs that have put America in the lead and kept Japan, Europe, and other economic competitors in the rearview mirror. America's ability to combine innovative brains with can-do brawn has meant higher standards of living, a huge middle class, and increased economic opportunity for millions of our citizens. This is our competitive advantage. This is what makes our country a mecca for entrepreneurs and ambitious workers the world over. Our technology incubators <coughs> are still pumping out the innovations, but our entrepreneurs and workers are increasingly being blown off the road. Governments around the world recognize the opportunity of the clean energy economy and are seizing it. The world will need to invest $26 trillion, that's trillion with a T, over the next two decades in order to meet our energy needs. Developing the clean technologies to serve that market is the scientific challenge of the generation. Harnessing the industrial might to manufacture those technologies and market them to the world is the economic opportunity of the generation. Last year, I went to China uh, with Mr. Sensenbrenner, with the speaker, and we viewed the wind turbines spilling out of factories. I returned home warning of these economic missiles pointed at the heart of the U.S. economy. Today, the clean energy investment auditors are here to share the dismal scorecard. Twice as much money was invested in clean energy in China as was invested in the United States last year. A decade ago, China made 1 percent of the world's solar panels. Today, it makes nearly half of them. The $15 billion worth of solar panels China exported last year was more valuable than America's corn, beef, and chicken exports combined. China is no longer coming. They are here. They ate our lunch, and they are moving on to our dinner. And China is not alone. Germany, Japan, South Korea, and other countries recognize that Dominating the trillion-dollar market of tomorrow requires foresight and public investment today. They are throwing the kitchen sink of policies at clean energy, renewable energy requirements, financing assistance, tax incentives, government procurements, carbon pollution limits. Here in the U.S., the longest-term federal incentive for clean energy expires in two years. Senate Republicans have steadfastly stood in the way of any and all long-term policies to support the manufacture and deployment of clean energy in this country. It is notable that we have entrepreneurs willing to invest in U.S. clean manufacturing at all in such an unpredictable environment. Some of China's clean energy incentives may be illegal violations of international trade agreements. Feeling that the future of America's clean energy sector is under threat, the United Steelworkers Union recently submitted a petition to the U.S. Trade Representative. The case alleges that China has used hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies and other illegal trade practices to undermine foreign competitors and dominate the sector. I am very concerned about China's use of unfair trade practices to bolster the competitiveness of its industries. And I urge prompt action to address violations found through the U.S. Trade Representative's investigation. But we must uh, not move forward recklessly on this trade dispute with China. In the end, competition is good. Competition is one of the chief reasons that the price of a solar panel has fallen by half in the last two years. Competition will ultimately make solar energy competitive with grid electricity in this decade, but this competition must be fair. It must allow American workers to play on the field. It must make it possible for us to export these technologies 
to other countries, especially to China. And that is why the U.S. trade rep uh, must do uh, the job that is necessary in order to protect American workers. So if we do not act decisively to provide the long-term and short-term incentives to make America the best place to invest clean energy dollars, someone else will. So let's get real. We will trade our addiction to Middle Eastern oil with an addiction to Asian or European clean energy technologies. From the Manhattan Project to the Apollo program to medical research to the Internet, government investments have and will continue to make America the place where the next great technological breakthroughs happen. The only question remains is whether American industry and workers will ride this technological wave. The stakes could not be higher. Let me now turn and recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in today's hearings, I expect a slew of experts to tell us what we already know. If we mandate that electric companies use wind energy, it will drive private investment into the wind sector. Of course it will. What investor wouldn't want a guaranteed market? If we mandate that everyone drives cars with square tires, we'll drive investment there, too. But that doesn't mean that we should. Choosing winners and losers doesn't work. Europe provided as much with regard to clean energy investment. In Europe, government subsidies drove investment toward renewable energy sources. That investment and all associated jobs dried up as soon as the subsidies lapsed. Just a few years ago, President Obama held Spain as the model for encouraging investment in solar energy. Today, Spanish unemployment is over 20 percent. Is that really the model we want to follow? <coughs> Europe proved that jobs associated with clean energy investment will last only as long as the government pays for them. Democrats couldn't get cap and tax through Congress, so now they're trying to circumvent voters and accomplish the same thing through the EPA. Their argument that if we don't force investors to spend their money here, they'll spend it abroad is wrong. The reality is that the technologies the Democrats want to mandate will drive the cost of our energy up, which will drive more manufacturing jobs overseas. Given the choice between one, forcing investment toward today's political darlings, or two, supporting sustainable market-tested businesses, I'm going to choose the latter every time. During the coming months, the American economy will be at the mercy of several environmental regulations from the Obama administration. These regulations will not generate jobs. They will generate significant costs for the businesses that create jobs. EPA's endangerment finding, which would allow the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, is the most widely followed and probably the most onerous example. Unless Congress stops it, these regulations will put EPA in charge of the U.S. economy. The EPA would target more than 1.3 million commercial sources, which the EPA defines to include office buildings, small businesses, schools, churches, prisons, and similar structures. The EPA estimates that an endangerment finding that doesn't include a legally suspect tailoring rule would cost small entities more than $55 billion. The Heritage Foundation says that it would lead to $7 trillion, with a T, in lost economic activity between 2010 and 2029 and would kill almost 3 million manufacturing jobs by 2029. One admi administration official told the Wall Street Journal that under the endangerment finding, the EPA was going to have to regulate in a command and control way which will probably generate even more uncertainty. And this is not the only economic threat posed by the Obama administration. The President is proposing tax increases on energy as a part of his latest $50 billion stimulus plan. One expert estimates that these new energy taxes would cost over 154,000 jobs by the end of 2011, more than $341 billion in lost economic output and more than $68 billion in lost wages nationwide. EPA has termed another set of onerous regulations, Boiler Mac. Uh, these regulations will set 
emission standards for hazardous air pollution. The Council of Industrial Boiler Owners released a study last week that showed exactly how much damage the Boiler MAC re regulations will inflict upon the economy. For every billion dollars spent on upgrade and compliance costs, up to 16,000 jobs and 1.2 billion in U.S. GDP will be threatened. With regulations like these, the entire American economy is threatened. With unemployment hovering around 10 percent, America does not need more job-killing regulations. America needs Congress to focus on creating jobs and economic growth. In our economic system, it is private investors who take risks. Financial success is the potential reward. If investors believe that renewable energy sources are the future, then I encourage them to invest in these markets. It is not, however, in America's interest to mitigate investors' risks by guarantee them a market. It makes sense that a Democratic Congress that responded to our economic collapse by socializing losses will now seek to shift the risk of investing from private businesses to the government. In today's hearing, the majority is effectively arguing that government should bet on winners and losers so that investors do not have to. The model is backwards and reflects a fundamental disagreement on American capitalism. While I will gladly work with Democrats to lower taxes and other disincentives for investment, I cannot support a model that I believe is at odds with how e our economy works. I thank the Chairman and yield back the balance of my time. We thank the gentleman. Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I will continue to uh, quote you ab about the uh, Chinese eating uh, our lunch and uh, beginning on our, our, on our dinner. Uh, I think that, it, that is exactly what is happening. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the, in the 1870s, uh, Thomas uh, Edison uh, uh, invented the, the light bulb. It is a unique creation uh, or invention uh, here in the United States. Uh, and uh, those light bulbs have been uh, a part of the um, uh, uh, industrial component of, of the U.S. economy uh, since uh, the 1870s. Uh, General Electric, Electric will discontinue uh, manufacturing uh, the light bulbs uh, that uh, we know as uh, incandescent uh, bulbs at the end of this month. Uh, and the United States will now purchase the CFLs uh, from uh, abroad, mostly from China. Uh, the uh, glass tubes uh, that are, are twisted uh, which helps in, the, in, the, in reducing the, the amount of energy needed, uh, about 75 percent uh, less energy, uh, requires a lot of hand labor. And that hand labor, of course, is infinitely cheaper in China. So uh, a unique American invention is now uh, being manufactured almost exclusively in China. And all of the people in this, in this uh, hearing room uh, will in the future purchase these new CFLs uh, after they've been imported uh, from China. Uh, I, I think that should be a, a wake-up call if there's one uh, needed. Uh, and uh, it is my hope that this hearing this morning uh, will allow some additional information to be brought forth uh, that will inspire uh, the great ingenuity that has made America what it is uh, to uh, continue and, and recapture particularly those, th those things that began on these shores. Uh, I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, now we will uh, turn to um, our first witness, uh, who is uh, Michael Liebreich. Uh, he is the chief executive of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. He is an experienced venture capitalist and entrepreneur who has helped build more than 25 companies. Uh, we welcome you. When you feel comfortable, please begin.
Good morning, Chairman Markey, gentlemen of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, by way of background, I founded New Energy Finance in 2004 to help investors and policymakers understand the economics of clean energy. I built a team of 140 experts around the world before we were bought at the end of last year by Bloomberg, the financial information provider. I'll divide my remarks into two sections. First, with the help yeah, of can, slides can you turn when they come up. Is that microphone on there? Oh. Can you try the turn on that microphone? It is. It's on. Is it on? Okay, it's on. great. Thank you. Okay. If we can pull up the slides, yep. Okay. I'll divide my remarks into two sections. First, uh, when the slides arrive, I'll provide an up-to-date picture of investment activity around the world. Secondly, I'll comment more generally on the related issues of jobs, policy, and international uh, competition. If we move to the first slide. As you can see from my first slide, global investment in new forms of clean energy surged from under 50 billion in 2004 to over 170 billion just four years later. These figures exclude traditional forms of lower carbon energy, large-scale hydro, natural gas, and nuclear, though I'd be the first to agree that these will play a significant role in the energy system of the future. In 2009, the volume of investment dropped by 7% to $162 billion as the sector was hit by the financial crisis. At one point, valuations of clean energy stocks were down from their peak by around 70% before recovering some of their losses. It is worth noting that they're still double what they were in 2003, a compound return over the last seven years of just under 10% per annum. The impact of the crisis on the industry could have been worse, and it would be tempting to think that the green stimulus programs around the world were the major factor in staving off disaster. However, Although we identified a total of $184 billion of such funds allocated for clean energy alone, the fact is that in 2009, only 9% of it reached companies and projects in need. In the US, investment fell off a cliff in the aftermath of the Lehman collapse. On an annualized basis, it was only this year that it started to climb again as the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds started to flow. The world's providers of concessionary finance, the IFC, European Investment Bank, Brazil's BNDS, and so on, were much quicker in responding to the crisis, increasing their lending from just $7 billion in 2007 to $21 billion in 2009. The role of these multilater multilateral institutions and development banks has often been overlooked. And these figures do not include the Chinese banks. Their provision of cheap finance to manufacturers and developers has been a major factor in driving surging investment there. By 2009, China's absorbing nearly three times the level of clean energy investment as the UK, the US, or Spain. In just the past five months, the China Development Bank has provided $27 billion in concessionary finance to Chinese wind and solar companies. China's leaders have supported the sector not only by providing cheap finance, but also by creating domestic demand on a grand scale, setting local content rules, maintaining tariffs on foreign imports, as well as, of course, maintaining an undervalued currency. Before we become too pessimistic about the state of clean energy in the US, we should recall that it remains by far the world's leading venue for venture investment. Even in clean energy technologies, U.S. companies spend more as a percentage of revenue on research, and the U.S. stock markets continue to attract public offerings from companies around the world. However, there is no question that the period 2007 to 2009 saw Asia take over from the Americas as the number two region of the world for clean energy investment. And when we compile the figures for 2010, we will see that Asia has eclipsed Europe to take the global lead. Now, if I might turn my attention briefly to the question of U.S. policy, those who deride the U.S. for inaction are not correct. Not only do 30 states have clean energy portfolio standards, but
but there are also significant national programs such as the renewable fuel standard, increasingly stringent cafe standards, substantial federal R&D programs. Our research shows that ARA, in particular its grants and loan guarantees, played a material role in keeping the flow of funding going during 2009 and 2010. What is missing is the sort of consistent policy framework that has driven the development of clean energy first in Denmark, Germany, and Spain, then China, and now the other major economies. In 2008, the South Korean president, Mr. Lee Myung-bak, presented a plan to cut the car country's carbon emissions by 30% from business as usual, without jeopardizing growth. The Korean government will be investing 2% of gross domestic product over the next five years, and leading Korean industrial companies have responded by announcing investments of over 80 billion between now and 2020. Contrast this with the US, where the industry's production and investment tax credits have in the past been allowed to expire every two years. A highly effective ARA program may not get extended, and in California, Proposition 23 is targeting the, re the repeal of AB 32. Alone amongst the major economies, the US negotiators had to make a commitment under the Copenhagen Accord to a cut in carbon emissions without national legislation in place to deliver it. It was Winston Churchill who said, the Americans will always do the right thing once they have exhausted all the alternatives. I have no doubt that the US will at some point wake up to the strategic necessity and growth opportunity offered by a shift to clean energy. I only hope other countries will not in the meantime have established an unassailable industrial lead. Many thanks for your patience in listening to me. Thank you very much. Our uh, next witness is Dr. Ravi uh, Viswanathan. Uh, he is a general partner at New Enterprise Associates, where he focuses on energy and growth equity investments. Uh, we thank you for being here, Doctor. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me here. It is truly an honor. I appear you before you here today as a general partner of New Enterprise Associates, or NEA. NEA is, by assets under management, the largest U.S. venture capital firm in the, in the country with $11 billion under management. Through our 30 years of history, we've, we've funded over 650 companies and have had over six 160 of them go public. Our 50 largest companies have created over $65 billion in revenues and have created hundreds of thousands <coughs> of jobs in this country. Today we have a global footprint with offices in India and China and roughly 20% of our committed capital targeted at emerging markets. In the past, the US VC industry has played a pivotal role in developing industries such as biotechnology, computing, medical devices, semiconductors, telecommunications, and the internet. We deploy our capital in rapidly expanding companies which have the highest potential for long-term economic growth and job creation. According to the National Venture Capital Association, US VC-backed company revenue has equated to more than 22% of U.S. GDP, and over the past three years alone, VC-backed companies have accounted for three times the growth rate in job creation than the private sector taken as a whole. Today, the energy technology industry represents one of the most compelling investment opportunities in the history of venture capital. I serve as the co-head of our energy practice, overseeing more than 30 portfolio companies here in the U.S. that have raised a total of $2 billion in capital. Our portfolio includes investments in sectors such as solar, wind, nuclear, advanced batteries, smart grids, electric vehicles, and energy-efficient building materials. Regarding the current U.S. clean tech landscape, the U.S. has long been the home of great innovation in clean energy technology, which continues to present a compelling opportunity for both entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. Though the U.S. continues to be the home of the world's best clean energy innovation, the U.S. has lost its leadership to China, Japan, and Germany in clean energy manufacturing deployment and is challenged and threatened by emerging economies such as India, South Korea, Malaysia, and the Philippines. I can say that from first-hand knowledge as I spend about a third of my time in Asia trying to understand how these economies are doing what they're doing in clean energy. These nations have outpaced the U.S. in recruiting, incenting, and developing domestic manufacture <coughs> of solar, wind, <coughs> and battery technology. We are not the market leader in producing and supply of this high-growth industry and have ceded our historic leadership in manufacturing of these key technologies to other nations. As one example, the U.S. market share for solar manufacturing has fallen from 45% in the mid-1990s to roughly 5% today. 
Prior to the Recovery Act, this paradigm of developing innovative technology in the U.S. and exporting manufacturing to foreign nations has been driven primarily by a significant imbalance between U.S. and foreign tax policies and incentives. Contrary to popular belief, low labor costs has not been the most important variable in this equation. Upfront manufacturers incentives, long-term tax holidays, and end market incentives have been frequently as important, if not more important, variables influencing U.S. companies as to where they should establish their manufacturing facilities. Incentives from foreign nations have often totaled as much as 40 or 50 percent of the cost of a new manufacturing project. In addition, healthy demand side incentives such as national renewable energy standards, feed-in tariffs, and direct government loans and tax credits for the deployment of clean energy technology have made relocating U.S. manufacturing facilities overseas even more attractive. Without competitive incentives for companies to stay in the U.S., this nation's best manufacturers have had no choice but to look overseas to remain competitive in their industries. The result has been a loss of both direct and indirect jobs, a loss of intellectual property, and a loss of economic growth here in the U.S. for one of the fastest growing global industries of the 21st century. In describing this trend, I must remind the committee that venture capitalists and entrepreneurs are by definition optimists. I believe the U.S. can be a leader in clean energy manufacturing and deployment, and I've witnessed this firsthand. We're not giving up on the American entrepreneur, and I hope you won't either. I'm grateful to this committee and the current administration for recognizing the need to level the playing field for U.S. clean energy manufacturing. With the help of the tax policies and incentives put forth in the Recovery Act, this nation's best energy technology companies are expanding their domestic capacity, reopening and retrofitted, retrofitting closed factories, rehiring and retraining new workers, and rebuilding local economies depressed by the Great Recession. One of the most important policies in restoring American competitiveness in clean energy is the Section 48C Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit, providing a 30 percent tax credit for investments in facilities that manufacture clean energy products such as solar panels and wind turbines. This program awarded $2.3 billion in tax credits to over 100 companies in 43 states and was oversubscribed with requests of over $8 billion in projects. Four of our most promising companies were awarded this credit and were able to expand manufacturing here in the U.S., creating jobs thanks to your efforts in the Recovery Act. One of these uh, companies was Ceneva, one of our companies. They were able to expand their solar manufacturing from 33 megawatts to 170 megawatts in Norcross, Georgia, hiring an additional 60 workers and creating more than 100 construction jobs in an economically depressed suburb of Atlanta. This Congress has put forth very important legislation which puts a price on carbon. Putting a price on carbon by, de by definition will reduce risk for all energy markets, decreasing the cost of capital and increasing investment in renewable energy. We believe this is an important policy for the U.S. to continue to attract capital to fuel the energy needs of our 21st century economy. Growing a strong domestic clean energy manufacturing industry requires competitive supply and demand side incentives and policies. In order for the U.S. to be truly energy independent in a world with clean, cheap, renewable energy, we need to reinvigorate our manufacturing base. We can't substitute our dependence on foreign oil with batteries, solar cells, or wind turbines made overseas. As I've discussed, most one of the most important pieces of the Recovery Act was the Section 48C Advanced Manufacturers Tax Credit. In addition, demand-side incentives such as the 1603 grant program for clean energy deployment have been critical to sustaining a healthy clean energy economy for U.S. manufacturers. We need to make these tax credits permanent and for refundable as put forth by members of this Congress. In addition, we need to focus on scaling up and commercializing this country's best technologies through public-private partnerships. Countries such as Germany, Japan, and China have all dedicated funds to scale up the commercialization of their technologies. We also need an effective national renewable energy standard and energy efficiency standard with an incentive system for utilities to move forward without delay. Today, 30 states have already adopted statewide renewable energy standards, but those policies are at risk should the federal government fail to act with certainty to adopt a national standard. In closing, we've never seen a greater opportunity to put capital to work in support of U.S. entrepreneurs. We believe this is the greatest economic opportunity for our, for our industry, for our entrepreneurs, and for our country. Thank you very much for inviting me here to be, be here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doctor, very much. Our next uh, witness is Tom Carboni. Uh, he it has had extensive experience in the renewable energy sector. He currently <coughs> serves as the CEO of Nordic Wind Power, the largest technology developer and manufacturer of two-bladed utility-scale wind turbines. He is also chairman of the Princeton Energy Group, a California-based developer of global renewable energy projects. Welcome, Mr. Carboni. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Congressman Cleaver. We, uh, we share your passion on the topic today of the global clean energy race. My name is Tom Carboni. I'm chairman of uh, Nordic Wind Power, an early stage uh, technology developer and manufacturer of a very unique wind turbine for the community wind space. Community wind consists of on-site 
wind power and small scale wind farms typically less than twenty megawatts but could be as large as one hundred megawatts locally connected to the distribution voltage close to the load our products and people have focused on making nordic wind power a leader in this segment our proven two bladed technology provides for less weight higher reliability ease of installation and operation most of all the lowest cost of energy compared to the traditional designs <coughs> our story is about technology that was born in Sweden, a company that was started in the UK, and today we are a U.S. corporation focused on a very interesting and growing segment within our domestic wind business. We formed the company in late 2007 as a UK limited corporation. We have headquarters in Berkeley, California, an assembly facility in Pocatello, Idaho, and an engineering unit in the UK. Last year we incorporated Nordic's parent in the U.S. as a Delaware corporation. We employ approximately 40 people. That's double what we had at the start of this year, and we will double our employment again within the next 9 to 12 months. <coughs> there are many more people uh, employed within our supply and installation partner, partner chain. Each of our 1 megawatt wind turbines provide enough clean electricity for the annual consumption of 250 to 300 American homes and reduce 300 tons of CO2 emissions. We acquired the turbine technology in Sweden, which was the result of a long-term R&D prototype program, which was sponsored by the Swedish government, universities, and private entities at a cost of about $75 million. Uh, we have invested well over $10 million in further improving that technology for local, uh, local market needs. Since late 2007, we have completed three rounds of financing uh, from venture capitalists here in the U.S. and U.K. and Europe. Uh, for a total committed capital investment of about $58 million. We are the beneficiaries of two uh, Recovery Act provisions. In July 2009, the company secured a $16 million DOE loan guarantee, which was part of a $25 million project to manufacture and commercialize this one megawatt wind turbine here in the U.S. The loan guarantee is a critical form of financing for Nordic wind power and for our future development, and it gives us the wherewithal to create jobs, invest in the supply chain, invest in tooling to become more efficient, and to offset some of our technology development costs. It's a loan. We have to pay it back. To date, we have not closed on this loan, but we are working diligently with the DOE uh, to expedite the closing of the loan, which, as I said, is critical to our development. It is our view that this program could be improved by adopting some of the existing uh, application, due diligence, and closing processes that already exist within our government, within other agencies like U.S. OPIC and USDA, particularly to address the needs of small business enterprises like ourselves. We are also the recipient of $3 million in advanced energy manufacturing tax credit, the 48C program that Dr. Viswanathan mentioned. This money will be used to expand and re-equip our manufacturing facility. This incentive will have a positive impact on our cash flow in the future when we have a tax liability. My point here is, to date, we have not deployed one dollar of the Recovery Act provisions, but we intend to and we're grateful for the awards that we have. Regarding our location decisions, when we started in 2007, we determined that there were three principal markets, the U.S., Europe and China. It is our view that China was saturated with nearly 100 domestic suppliers and JVs that are competi competing predominantly on low cost and low margin and secondarily on quality and reliability. This market could be especially challenging for an entry uh, uh, foreign company like ourselves. We saw limited opportunities for new entrants into the slower growing European onshore wind markets. Thus, the strength of the U.S. market's growth and potential for success was an obvious, obvious entry point for Nordic wind power, and in particular, the community wind sector, which was relatively unaddressed by the major wind turbine manufacturers. The company is in the process of establishing and relocating to a new center of U.S. operations in the Midwest wind belt. We expect that employment at that new location will increase to 250 over the next five years and will require at least 18 million in investment. To say the least, wind turbine manufacturing is capital intensive, where a significant amount 
of cash can be tied up in the supply chain for working capital and in equipment to manufacture these units. As such, as an early stage company like ours, a large emphasis is on near-term effective okay. cash value of incentives being offered at the local, state, and federal level. We started to deliver and install wind turbines this year, and we expect to deliver and service over 100 wind turbines over the next two years, totaling nearly $120 million in sales revenues. Our five-year plan includes new product introductions and shipments of more than 750 units. We will deliver and install our sixth N1000 wind turbine this year at Fort Huachuca in Arizona. This is the first utility-scale wind turbine on the U.S. Army base. We have two wind turbines supplying one power to a school in Indiana, another to a municipality. And I would like to mention that three of our in wind turbines were exported and installed in a project in Latin America with the Made in America stamp of quality on them. In closing, I'd like to provide some recommendations, if I may. Um, my recommendations are based on three programs that already have, that exist today or are contemplated, that already have spent time and a considerable amount of, of, of energy and bipartisan cooperation. And my, my recommendations are intended to make the programs more effective for innovative U.S. energy companies like ours to, so that we could compete more effectively. Number one, and you've heard it from Dr. Viswanathan, pass the Federal Renewable Electricity Standard, the REX. The, wind energy, uh, the American Wind Energy Association estimates that a quarter of a million jobs will be created by this. Uh, half you could, of those. And I, Mr. Cobb, if you could just try to summarize quickly, you'll get a chance to expand in the yes. question and area. Uh, Two more recommendations. Qu quickly, yes. Yes. The uh, Extend the Recovery Act 1603 program and allow for the uh, 48C manufacturing tax credit to be refundable so that early stage companies like ours could use them today as opposed to in the future when we have a tax liability. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our final witness uh, is um, uh, Mr. Mark Fulton. He is the Managing Director and Global Head of Climate Change Investment Research and Strategy at Deutsche Bank. Uh, he has nearly uh, 30 years of experience as an economist and a strategist. We welcome you, sir. Chairman Markey, uh, Please, yeah, okay, good, yeah, good. Chairman Markey, Ranking men Member Sensenbrenner and members of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the global clean energy race. In my role in the Asset Management Division of Deutsche Bank, I coordinate a research team that looks at the investment opportunities that climate change and associated clean energy technologies offer around the world. Since we in Asset Management started issuing educational white papers on these themes in 2007, the basis of our investment thesis has been demographic pressures on resources and environmental externalities as identified from scientific sources, combined with energy security and economic opportunity, has led to government policy response at all levels, creating new technologies and industries as companies respond. As we sit here today, the U.S. federal and indeed state governments are at a crucial crossroad in their policy stance on clean energy. Will they take action to deepen and extend policies, or will they fall behind other countries around the world? The stakes are high in terms of energy security, new jobs, industries, and the climate. Certainly in a U.S. context, policy at federal, state, and local levels are all important. This year in the United States has been a challenging one for those looking to invest in these new clean energy industries on a longer-term basis. Uncertainty abounds. At a federal level, given political complexity, there's been no energy or climate bill passed out of the Senate to complement the comprehensive approach taken by the House of Representatives in passing the American Clean Energy and Security Act that directly tackled climate issues and provided significant funding to clean energy and energy efficiency. At the same time, the most comprehensive climate and clean energy provisions of any state are under threat from California's Proposition 23, which seeks to suspend the state's Global Warming Solutions Act and would have a significant impact. Working for investors as an asset manager, these uncertainties are discouraging to capital deployment in the U.S. in the long term. We have formulated a simple but fundamental framework for assessing regulatory environments around the world, which we call TLC, Transparency, longevity and certainty. Investors need transparency in policies to create understanding and a level playing field. Longevity means policy has to match the time frame of the investment and stay the course. 
Certainty refers to knowing that incentives are financeable. In economic terms, TLC should result in a lower cost of capital for projects while still delivering a fair and market-related return to capital. For instance, I believe that U.S. renewable policies could include more elements of TLC. State-level renewable portfolio standards set targets for renewable deployment. However, in most cases, they do these do not have enforcement measures nor penalties to ensure they are financed. Renewable energy projects have therefore relied much in the short term on the complementary investment tax credit and production tax credit tax equity programs to get financed. Due to lack of longevity, this has produced an on-off pattern in renewable deployment. Since the financial crisis, the tax equity market has not been strong, and so the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 introduced the six Section 1603 Treasury Cash Grant. This indeed has been successful in generating projects in the past year, especially when combined with the Advanced Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit to encourage domestic production. But these programs sunset in 2011, and the renewable project pipeline is already under pressure as the tax equity market still struggles. As outlined in a paper released on September the 16th by U.S. PREF, this puts over 100,000 jobs at risk. The Department of Energy's Section 1703 and 1705 loan guarantee programs for early and later stage clean energy projects also sunset in 2011. Looking around the world, we see many countries embodying TLC in their climate and energy policies and achieving capital deployment. As a German bank, we have knowledge of the German experience in particular. In a recent paper, we looked at the major elements of a strong policy regime. In the passage of the EEG in 2000, which was updated in 2009, Germany established a feed-in tariff regime that supports the EU-mandated goal of 20% renewable energy as a share of electricity by 2020. This embodies TLC for investors. The result has been 300,000 jobs, renewable energy at a 13% share of electricity and rising, a rapid fall in solar PV costs in particular, leading to lower tariffs on the digression schedule with a forecast of grid parity by 2013. In summary, to build secure, vibrant 21st century green and clean energy sector, U.S. policy has to engage in TLC in some policy package. The fully comprehensive approach, such as embodied in the American Clean Energy and Security Act, is certainly a fundamental framework with strong elements of TLC. However, that is clearly open to a great deal of debate. In the Senate, a number of bills have been proposed. Indeed, even without a carbon market, a comprehensive and strong national renewable energy, a national renewable electricity standard complementing state RPS, combined with long-term financial incentive programs that have longevity, and a clean energy bank looking at loan guarantees, as well as continued focus on energy efficiency, would be very encouraging. I happen to believe that state-level feed-in tariffs, if they spread, would be positive. We'd also like to note Congressman Inslee's national feed-in tariff proposal in the Renewable Energy Jobs and Security Act. In closing, I thank the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming for this opportunity to testify and share our perspective. I applaud the committee's commitment to addressing these important energy and climate issues. This is not just a matter of good policy for the United States. There is a global movement happening that is creating economic activity and a race to scale. So there is a question of urgency in whether U.S. citizens will share in the new wealth being created right now by extending what is already working in the sec Section 1603 Treasury Cash Grant and the Advanced Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit, Congress can help to underpin a growing industry and create or preserve valuable jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulton, very much. Now I'm going to turn and recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for as much time as he may consume in his uh, question and answer period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let, let me apologize to the panel. Um, I have two other committee hearings uh, that started at 10 o'clock, Homeland Security and Financial Services. Uh, one is here and one is in another building, so I apologize. Uh, this is, uh, to me, uh, extremely uh, important. And Mr. Capone, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for um, the, the, the uh, great work your, your company is doing. Um, this is a somewhat convoluted uh, question, uh, but, but large Chinese windmills um, are selling for about $685 per megawatt of capacity. Uh, in the United States, it's about eight hu $825 uh, per megawatt of c capacity. So uh, the, the, the Chinese are, are able to, to sell it uh, infinitely cheaper. That is probably because of 
and they probably violate some WTO rules, but but in addition to that, um, they are getting uh, government uh, backed loans to to do the work, and when you combine that with and and they they're doing land deals, um, and uh, there is a chance that China could suffer the same fate that hit us uh, in December of 2007, the beginning of the recession, which is the, the collapse of the real estate market. So th their plants are connected to land deals, uh, and the government uh, is, is backing the loans. Do we have to wait on a potential collapse, do you think, uh, in China, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, economy uh, before we have a chance to catch up? Or, or is there something that we can do to not only catch up, but to uh, supersede uh, the Chinese? <coughs> Thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Cleaver. Uh, in our view, and particularly my view, I, it, it, in, what in our analysis, it was difficult for us to export to China from the United States with our, with our wind turbine. <coughs> Although a, a large amount, the majority of our part numbers are sourced here in the United States, a fair amount of the value is today imported, and that was the result of a very constrained local market here in terms of the supply chain in 2008 and 2009 when we had a, a large boom in business that caused us to go offshore. We're currently domesticating uh, a big part of our, uh, of our supply. We're finding, and since we've gone global with our, our supply chain, we're finding uh, very competitive domestic supply for wind turbine components. There is capacity, and I'm sure that's driven down the, uh, uh, down the supply. My figures are a bit different than yours in terms of what is the, uh, the, the wind turbine package to a wind farm here in the U.S. Uh, our, our pricing, the pricing of our competitors are in excess of 1.2 to 1.5 billion. Uh, uh, we have seen a Chinese supply coming at about 1 million a megawatt ins installed. Um, however, we've also seen um, that it's more than just the product. It's the process and the people behind that product and how these products are serviced over the 20 years that they're expected uh, to operate. So I think today between the com there is competitiveness within the U.S. Uh, supply chain. It, it is actually improving. These incentives that we talked about today, particularly the ones that Nordic is trying to employ, will increase our productivity and our therefore our competitiveness. Uh, it will be a fight for sure with uh, with Chinese wind turbines and Korean wind turbines coming to the U.S. Uh, to the U.S. shores, so I think it's a f it's a good fight. It's the one that we really uh, I think have the opportunity uh, to combat. Well, let, let me ask the, uh, any 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 or all of you one question: If you were sitting here uh, and and necessarily engaging in a debate uh, with uh, some good people uh, who ha who think differently. Um, who say who who would say that you know we we can't you know expend uh, large amounts of of, uh, of uh, taxpayer dollars at this time because we need to concentrate on reducing or eliminating uh, the deficit. So every discussion that surfaces is uh, is is going to have that as a background. You know, do we spend money? Uh, to do to to uh, you know make sure that we are a 21st century nation, uh, or do we forget that and and deal with the deficit? What I'm just curious about what any of you would would say in in that hypothetical. Well, no, it's not hypothetical. It's a, a very real uh, debate. I maybe I could jump in on that uh, uh, first. Um, yeah, I think given the choice, reducing the deficit has to be a, a, a priority. Uh, so even if we go, even if we fall further behind. No, I, I let me finish go my, ahead, go my ahead. statement. I think what we need, though, is, is the market signals. We, we need a renewable electricity standard to actually provide a market signal and let the markets, uh, you know, let the supply base, let the turbine manufacturers, the solar companies respond to it competitively. Uh, in, in my mind, that would be a, a much stronger a signal, particularly a long-term policy uh, signal. Mm -hmm. 
I think, uh, first of all, it's very difficult to have that discussion with somebody if they haven't first agreed that there is um, a benefit to this shift towards cleaner energy and towards, uh, in a sense, energy that comes out of technology rather than energy that comes out of the ground. Um, so that's the first. Now, I it's so that that's my caveat before I start. Well, I that, that ends it pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, it certainly it certainly it certainly um, you know hinders the discussion with some with some folks. But there are a lot of uh, people who actually you know th they're you know are in the middle camp where they you know they see the need they see China forging ahead Korea is about to start Europe is and and actually do see the need to take action and then the uh, then the issue that you raise specifically around the the deficit is one that I think one can deal with because I think that there are ways of um, designing policy that don't just require checks to be written by either federal or state governments. And so uh, the uh, renewable portfolio standards, uh, if they had the appropriate teeth, um, would actually achieve a lot of that. It's not necessary just to incentivize, just to pay money for the good energy. You can actually mandate a volume and then let the market decide how to fulfill that. But if you go that route, then it does have to have teeth. There's no point having a renewable portfolio standard that can be bought out at such a low price that it essentially is ineffective. Um, there are other areas where there are barriers um, to switching to clean energy. There are other areas where some of the um, uh, some of the externality costs of the alternatives ought to be priced in. Um, and so I think that the, you the important thing is to go through the policy and, and look at ways of doing it that don't hit the budget. If you believe that it is important, then that's the challenge ahead. So, Congressman Fuhrer, I think it's a, it's a very fair um, uh, discussion on the wanting to reduce the deficit. Uh, what I would say, if I were in your shoes and, are, and uh, discussing w with these other folks, is uh, it comes down to a few things. It comes down to job creation, global, global competitiveness, and energy independence. And if we have these incentives, jobs will be created here. If you don't have these incentives, for sure they're going to be created elsewhere. And, and here's what the frightening scenario is, and I can say this from traveling in Asia. These uh, economies, they have speed um, and capital and scale, and they're exercising that in the manufacturing side. Now that they're getting leadership positions on the downstream part of these clean energy technologies, they're doing something that we hadn't anticipated them doing, and they're going upstream and they're starting to innovate. Once they start innovating, then our Bulwark, our strength, our fortress, which we've had for hundreds of years, which is innovation, starts getting compromised. So I think I while the short term is obviously to focus on the deficit, I would encourage everyone to start thinking about intermediate and longer term because that trend, empirical data suggests it's happening. It's happening in solar, it's happening in wind, it's happening in batteries, it's happening in electric vehicles. And so that's the, the, that's the, 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 the fear that, that my partners and our industry face when we look at these, uh, these global factors. I mean, I, I would e echo everything I've heard, but maybe make two, two extra points. One obvious, obvious point about the budget, you know, it's got a lot of numbers in it, tax, spending, it's a huge animal, and it's really up to the United States to decide where it wants to spend and tax uh, within that balance as it brings the deficit down, and how important it feels that being on the front end of the clean energy race really is in terms of its long-term competitiveness. So it's a question of priorities, and, uh, you know, we believe that this is a strong priority. I think the second point bringing up what, what Michael said was that uh, you know, there are different ways to construct incentive programs. Some run through the budget, some run directly into the ratepayer base. And essentially a lot of the European feed-in tariffs do not run through the budget. So then there's a question of do you feel that's the right thing into the electricity base? That's then the next question that comes up. So there are ways of constructing these incentives in different, you know, I, you can do it, do it, but as long as you do it with TLC is our point, fine and you can get it done and if you don't get any longevity because it's running through the budget then of course that's an issue thank you uh, you're back mr chairman does the gentleman need more time or he, he can continue if he wants yeah. well of course there's no tlc up here on the hill but what what i <laughs> 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 um i i'm i agree i mean we, we've got to make as uh, you know some some uh, choices uh, if, if we're, we're going uh, going to do this but um, 
I, 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 my, my fear is wh while we're struggling with the choices, we fall further behind. And, 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 uh, and, and nothing moves swiftly uh, here. Um, and, and I, I guess I, I, um, I'm not looking for you to solve this, the, this, the, this dilemma, uh, but you, you have helped craft, uh, I think, for me at least, uh, uh, an argument. What do you say, though? Um, uh, I mean, Mr. Uh, since Brennan, my friend, left, uh, he uh, uh, had another uh, commitment. But uh, y you know, I if you if if this is always presented as um, you know some kind of new way to tax the public, uh, you poison the public to the need to, uh, to to move and move swiftly to create Ms. Fulton yeah well I, I think it's interesting actually we talk a lot about costs but there's still a big debate about how to measure those costs so you know at a very narrow level we look at the so-called cash costs of deploying say you know solar against coal but of course what we the, the wider debate is what are the externalities what are the real costs of those technologies uh, are those fuel sources and that's when of course it gets more difficult because we're talking about economists call externalities but when you start loading in the externalities if you happen to believe the environmental impacts health impacts and so on then you get very different numbers as to what's you know yielding um, I think the second point I'd like to say is that we hear a lot about how this is just uh, a lot of subsidies and you know keeping the market going when it should just be you know uh, doing it itself. I think the point is that we particularly see these as, a, I, I'd like to call them incentives to scale. Essentially, these are new industries scaling up. Every new industry, really big industry, you go look at history, gets some help from government when it's scaling, generally. So, and we know fossil fuel industries around the world, by the way, have between three and 500 billion of subsidies, which is calculated by the IEA. So it's not a level playing field anyway. And secondly, so what I'd say to you is that if you think about it, what we're trying to do is incentivize the scale deployment of these new industries. And as they do that, their learning curves, their costs come down. And we're hearing that. And you know, the Germans believe that as they've incentivized the supply side response of solar PV, and we've seen the crash in prices, which they're now reflecting in their tariff digressions, then we're going to see you know, grid parity against the fossil fuels you know, within three to five years maximum. So we keep talking about is always subsidized. No, these are incentives to scale, to develop industries, to make the clean economy work. And you're right, at the end of the day, the next five years, I actually think the next five years are very crucial because grid parity is sort of coming as these industries build. And during that process, have you incentivized your own manufacturing base and your own economies to participate in that? Thank you. I've had a, um, a, you know, a minute or two to reflect on how um, we can perhaps try and help you to persuade uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner uh, to approve some of the measures that, uh, that you, might, you, you might want to. And I think that um, I would probably start by um, talking about you know, the, the risk to the U.S. economy is not going to be defined by the odd program here or there and a few billion more or less of, of this or that grant program or loan guarantee. The issue that really is at stake here is whether the US is going to be a price taker on energy in its economy for the next two decades, 50 years, 100 years. If you go back in history, while uh, the US was a, net, uh, 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 was, was a net exporter, was producing enough uh, energy domestically for its own demands, that was not an issue. And what's happened as US oil has depleted uh, and imports have gone up and up, the U.S. is a price taker on energy, and this has been at the root of the, the, the a, a number of different episodes of economic instability, which have actually destroyed enormous numbers of jobs along the way. And it's because the U.S. is a price taker on energy, fundamentally. Now you move to these technologies, and I think, and the analysis that we do, and my fellow panel, panel members will confirm, that these energy technologies will become cheaper in the long term than fossil fuels. And so the US has an opportunity. So the world will shift to these technologies. It won't be fast. We're talking decades, sometimes perhaps many decades. But this is the shift that's going to happen. 
And then the question is, is the U.S. going to be a price taker on those technologies? You used the example of um, compact fluorescent light bulbs. Move to the next stage, LEDs. We're going to be buying those from Taiwan. Are we going to be a price taker on our main electricity power and on our main fuel sources because we've not developed these industries here in the U.S.? Uh, and I think that there is an opportunity. There is really, this is, a, this is the real debate. And so if you can win that debate about whether the U.S. has to lead in these technologies, then the discussion with Mr. Sensenbrenner and his colleagues perhaps is about how to do that rather than about the desirability of doing that. And the evidence that perhaps could contribute to that is evidence around the economics of this stuff. The, experience, the, the last five years has been very unusual because, first of all, the amount of demand that suddenly arrived in the industry overwhelmed the supply chain. From 2004 through to 2008, the price of clean energy went up, not down. The long-term history is it comes down. There's an experience curve. This stuff is driven by developing technology, developing logistics, developing supply chain, developing skills, developing financing mechanisms, and so on, and the price comes down. And the last two years, we've seen that really, we've seen the costs come down in a way that's caught up with those trends. And I think that when you start to delve into the fact you have fossil fuels getting more expensive, and you have fossil fuels causing accidents like uh, what we've seen, uh, the, the tragedy on the Gulf Coast that we've just all lived through. And then you contrast that with the costs coming down, and you can provide data on that. This is, a, this is something that, that yields to analysis. Then I think maybe the debate moves on from whether we have this program or that, and is this just tax and spend, or is this just a subsidy, and will it just stop? And the, and the fact that Spain's solar program blew up because it was poorly constructed, Spain's wind program certainly didn't, and Germany's solar program didn't, and China's solar and wind program certainly didn't, and Brazilian ethanol program certainly didn't. There are plenty of examples one can bring to bear that, that back up this thesis that this is the future of the energy industry, and America really needs to get into the price-giving and not the price-taking position. Thank you very kindly. We thank the gentleman uh, very much. Um, I, and I think that the gentleman from Missouri in his questions has laid out, you know, the <clears throat> and your answers have helped to lay out the, the challenge for America. And uh, a, a couple of you uh, mentioned uh, this challenge to AB 32 in California. You, you mentioned that there is now an attempt to repeal uh, the clean energy laws of California. And, uh, and therein lies our challenge, because that attempt to repeal the clean energy laws in California is being financed by the Koch brothers, Tess Aro, uh, and by Valero, three companies with oil refineries in Texas. So Texas is financing. Uh, uh, Texas refineries uh, are financing an effort to repeal California uh, clean energy laws, huh? And so, what is what's the stake there? Who are the winners if the Koch brothers, Tessero, and Valero win? Well, the winners are those three companies and China. <laughs> you know, those are your two big winners up on the scoreboard. The losers, of course, are anyone that was interested in creating a domestic renewable uh, energy industry here in the United States uh, with the potential to create hundreds of thousands of millions of jobs. Um, Mr. Fulton, could you talk about what is at stake in California uh, in terms of this battle over AB 32 and what it represents uh, uh, if that law is actually repealed by these oil refineries in the United States uh, financing that effort? Yeah, uh, it is a suspension, till, as you know, till uh, California reaches 5.5 percent unemployment for a number of quarters, which we have not seen for a long, long time. So technically it is suspension, but people would assume it would last quite a while. Um, and it would cause, I think uh, we actually quote the UC Berkeley paper that has looked at this, which uh, I think is a Could very you move that microphone in just Sorry, a yeah. little bit closer, please? Uh, the, the UC Berkeley paper that has looked at this very comprehensively, I think, is, is very instructive. 
Um, but essentially, I think one of the points, apart from the fact that it would have a, a very significant effect on what is going on in California itself, and of course, the t the li the, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about how AB 32 then spills over into all of other Calif California's other um, green uh, laws. Um, but essentially, you know, everyone would assume that that would put a very uh, major stop on uh, on the clean and green development in California. And I think, as is pointed out, the signal effect uh, within the United States, and you could even say globally, might be fairly significant because California has always been seen as a leader um, I uh, globally uh, to some extent in this whole story. And why would three oil refiners from Texas want to stop that law in California? Uh, well, I, I'm not an oil expert, but uh, uh, I assume they, they feel that that's, uh, that's something that would, uh, would be good for them. I don't know. You don't know. I guess you don't have to be Dick Tracy to figure out uh, why they would be opposed <laughs> to it. The oil refining industry clearly has a stake in putting uh, an end to this clean energy revolution. Uh, not all of them. There are some that are willing to make the transition. But these three companies are clearly intending on keeping us dependent upon imported oil on the one hand and not putting in place a domestic policy that challenges China uh, in terms of the manufacturing of the new technologies that inevitably are going to be deployed here in the United States, if for no other reason that states have uh, put on the books their own laws that are going to require renewable energy uh, to be uh, deployed, uh, and local governments increasingly as well. Uh, Mr. Viswanathan, you mentioned AB 32 as well, I think, in your statement. Uh, I didn't, but I think uh, my, my comment is- Can you move that microphone yeah. in just a little bit closer, please? Yeah. So I would echo everything you've said. I think it's, it would be disastrous. You know, if you look at what's happened in innovation, and my colleagues have eloquently pointed out about how the costs have come down. So. The whole field of material science, which is the underpinnings of a lot of these technologies, has grown up. It used to be science projects in universities. We spun them out of universities. We helped scale them. And w guess what happened? That happened three to five years ago. Uh, in that period of time, you had uh, an economic meltdown. You had capital that, that fled the system. You had China, uh, with their commitment and resolve, take over. And so you, you keep getting body blows, and this is yet another one. And so this really doesn't help us at all in what we're trying to do, which is take these technologies who have actually come of age, and this is when you want to really press fast forward and get into that next level. You know, th these negative incentives uh, can, be, can be disastrous. Uh, do any of the rest of you wish to comment on how disastrous a repeal of the California uh, clean energy laws would be? Mr. Leibright. Um, I could comment on how disastrous it would be. I think, again, it wouldn't, we don't need to be Dick Tracy to know that it would be disastrous because California is seen uh, not just as, as a U.S. leader in essentially capping its uh, energy use per capita, um, but it's also actually a, a global leader. Um, but I want to comment on, um, I think, w one aspect of this, which is that um, even with money from oil companies, it wouldn't be threatening. There would be no chance of success if they were not tapping into a strain of concern and skepticism amongst you know, a proportion of the population. And so I think um, having accepted that it would be ca catastrophic, it's something that definitely will set the industry back considerably. Um, perhaps some thoughts on uh, what could be done to, um, to create a, a protection against that. Because I think that um, the debate has become too much about subsidies or not. Well, just, and just so I can say this, so yeah. you know, the Koch, the Koch brothers also finance Tea Party activities. And just so you say, yeah. it, it, it do, and it does tap into something that's quite de uh, deep, because 70 percent of Tea Party um, uh, members do not believe in evolution. So to the extent to which they don't believe in evolution, uh, and they don't believe in clean, en clean energy. I guess they are tapping into something. The question is, are they tapping into anything that is valid scientifically? Uh, and if they pu pour, uh, you know, millions of dollars into that effort, do they drive an ultimate result that is completely at odds uh, with everything that we know scientifically and technologically that we should be advancing as a strategy in our country? So, I, I understand what you're saying that yeah. they're tapping into something, but I just want to define that they're also creating the thing that they're tapping into 
um, which is this uh, uh, defiance of 150 years of scientific uh, uh, breakthroughs uh, in our society. I, I agree. I have speculated privately as to whether uh, there's a correlation between those who deny evolution to those who don't believe in climate change to those who don't believe we can ever change to new energy sources. Well, if, uh, they're if the same source of funding is uh, is uh, providing right. the the public uh, debate on those issues, then you, you, while you're looking at the people who are reflecting what they're reading, what they're hearing, the questions that are raised, um, you have to understand that it all goes back to these oil refiners yeah. uh, that are financing these efforts uh, and not necessarily to advance the, the goals of denial of evolution, but rather to use those people as a way of then killing things that they believe might uh, interfere with their own economic object, uh, objectives, which is the continuation of massive importation of oil into the United States uh, from the Middle East that they have the opportunity to refine. So I don't think, again, that is a complex formula. I think every American, every thinking American uh, uh, actually supports that. No, I, I, but I, I, it, I, one could get into a discussion. I actually trust that people are pretty smart about, you know, not entirely smart, but they'll they'll figure out who's doing the talking. So, but I want to move just because I think that there is a see. Here's the problem that, that we, as you know, there are new Supreme Court decisions that actually allow for a masking of who is financing uh, much of what is going to be going on in America. So you have almost the worst case scenario, you know, where the people who have an agenda. Uh, uh, are also increasingly able to mask their agenda uh, under the guise of raising other issues that don't go to their own economic interests here, which would be oil, you know, being imported, which they get a job, they they have the opportunity to refine and to spew it up into the atmosphere. So I just want to make it clear that the political terrain is not such that it makes it uh, transparently easy for the voter. To understand exactly what, in fact, what is I at stake uh, as these issues are being publicly debated. So, I, p please continue. Um, so, what I wanted to suggest is that there is, however, a powerful constituency that one could try to uh, that, there that one could try to um, develop to oppose that uh, th those the money that's being spent uh, on the repeal campaign, and that is California's technology. Um, community um, and also those who – people need to understand that this is the way to create jobs and wealth and prosperity. So to counter um, this idea that uh, all it is is about increasing taxes and giving away money to technologies that don't work. And a particular constituency, I think, that has not been brought into this whole discussion um, is around uh, the, the telecoms, the IT industry. Um, the industry of innovation around um, the electrical system more broadly um, because if we are going to integrate these large quantities of clean energy, then there's all sorts of other industries, in particular that around uh, telecoms and uh, information technology, who are going to benefit enormously. And to a certain extent, they are sitting on the sidelines and not getting involved in the discussion. And I think that the people in California and elsewhere don't necessarily understand just how many jobs are required if we start building out the grid and we start integrating these technologies very broadly um, into our, our lives. And we, we saw what happened uh, with the Internet, which again, it was, it was funded originally through government spending, the development of it. It then went viral in the economy and it created hundreds of thousands and then millions of jobs in very unpredictable ways, ways that could not have been predicted when the first um, grant appropriations were made to experiment with or to, to build out the first implementation. So I think there's a constituency that needs to be educated as a counterweight to those who suggest we should do nothing and, and simply cut taxes and walk away from this problem. Bill number one was to create the 18-inch satellite dish industry. 
which the cable industry opposed because they didn't want the competition. Uh, but that put pressure on the cable industry to deploy even greater capacity. Uh, second was moving over 200 megahertz of spectrum in 1993. Um, that created the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cell phone license in the United States. They all went digital and went to under 10 cents a minute. The two incumbents, uh, who for this purpose would be the oil refineries uh, in a telecommunications sense, they were both analog and 50 cents a minute with a phone the size of a brick in 1993. And uh, the third bill became the Te Telecommunications Act of 1996, which moved us from dial-up to broadband, uh, which moved us from uh, black rotary dial phones to Blackberries. Huh? Uh, by '98, there's a new company called Google that can be started, and Hulu, and YouTube, and eBay, all highly anticipatable. Not in terms of what they actually do, but with this incredible additional broadband, yeah, we're going to create a couple of million new jobs. That was my strategy back in the 1990s. I knew what I wanted to accomplish, but you needed new public policies because the incumbent two companies weren't going to move rapidly in that direction. It's always good to have. Uh, a monopoly or uh, a duopoly in any marketplace. You can divvy it up 50 percent apiece, which is a good business if you can get it. Uh, so uh, we need to do the same thing here, and we need to do the public education that explains how these new jobs are going to be created for a new economy. Uh, and of course, they are going to be created, but they will be in China. They are going to be created, but they will be in Germany. They are going to be created, uh, but uh, uh, they will be in other parts of the world, and we will inevitably wind up importing them into our country. That is our challenge. So I have a chart here that I would like you each to comment upon, and because I think it, it gets to the point that each of you have been making. This is a, a chart put together by 1366, which is a, uh, a photovoltaic company up in Lexington, Massachusetts. And what it does is it charts the price of uh, photovoltaic, the uh, install uh, cost of uh, electricity uh, per a kilowatt hour from 1978 at $5 a kilowatt hour uh, down to about 22, 23 cents a kilowatt hour today. Uh, and it, it essentially, uh, every time there is, uh, and I'll just, it assumes an annual production growth of 35 percent and an 18 percent learning curve. Uh, photovoltaic cost based on 18 percent capacity factor and a 7 percent discount rate. So you can see that it is almost like a Moore's law of photovoltaics, huh? and it keeps moving inexorably lower in terms of its costs. Uh, and they project that by the year 2020, it will be at the cost of coal, if not sooner. Mr. Fulton and others have pointed that out. Could be sooner. And that once you hit the cost of coal, it could almost by 2020, because of the developing world and their need to install new uh, energy technologies, could become 7 percent of all electricity generation in the planet. Now, again, you have to have a little bit of vision here on this subject, because when we were basically moving over the spectrum for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cell phone license, our goal was, of course, not just to lower the price here in America, but to create a new global industry. Who would think that in 2010 it would be cell phones in villages of Africa and Asia and South America that would be the markets? Well, you first have to have a policy that develops the products that can then open up these markets, and these countries could jump the wireline revolution and go right to cell phones, huh? which is what happened. Right. Well, the same thing can happen here with photovoltaics. Huh? You don't have to build out that entire electricity grid. So that is kind of the vision. Do any of you want to comment upon, this is Professor Emmanuel Sachs at MIT. He is the guy who developed the technology that was used by Evergreen mm -hmm. uh, Solar Company. And now this new company, you know, he believes, is 40 percent more efficient than uh, a technology even more, you know, dramatically more efficient than even his Evergreen uh, uh, photovoltaic technology. Anyone want to comment on this vision and where we can go and how we can have a domestic production capacity rather than inevitably importing it from China? Mr. Fulton. Actually, it, it may sound technical, but I think you can even make it look more 
aggressive than that because I mean he's too conservative in terms yeah, of well this revolution. There's particularly something that the the Germans, uh, uh, the German Environment Ministry, when they were looking at how much their feed-in tariff cost, they did something called a com uh, the effect of the uh, the merit order run of a load curve of electricity. So what they talked about was the fact that solar PV comes in at the peak load when gas peakers are usually running gas peak is the most expensive form of electricity on the grid. Normally we look at average costs, but when you look at gas peakers, if you replace the gas peakers, uh, then you have a very big effect. Now the, the German Environment Ministry estimated that the whole of the feed-in tariff was entirely paid for by the cost of replacing the gas peakers. Uh, yeah, in simple terms it says, it's a standard offer document, it's about two pages long, anyone? standard offer documents, very easy to understand. Yeah. So what it means is a standard offer. Offer. Yeah, so what it means is that everyone gets the same bit of paper in front of them, whether you're a utility, an independent power producer, whoever you are. You get a two-page document. You know what you're getting, what tariff you're getting. So essentially the tariffs are set um, by the government, but in consultation with the market in terms of costs. They're reviewed, and in the German system, there's a digression over time, and the digression is actually targeted at what they believe will be grid parity. Therefore, the signal is given to the industry, you'd better be on that curve, because we're not paying you to get off the curve. We're paying you to get on the curve. And that's why I call them incentives at scale. There's a strong signal, this is a temporary incentive, get to scale, get your costs down. And they try to influence the direction of the digression of the cost curve. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I, that's what I think I said to yeah. 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 Uh, produ uh, once something reaches seven percent of global electricity production, that's a great economic opportunity, and it will only grow as each year goes by. And right now, in your opinion, you know, do well, we have that, that do I we have a program in place that that will keep these companies? Uh, here in the United States, given the fact, here's the interesting, that uh, last year, 45 percent of the solar technology in the world was produced in China, and they exported 95 percent of it. They did not deploy it in China. They exported 95 percent of it. So that's get, this gets to the U.S. Trade Representative. This gets to what the steel workers are talking about. This gets to whether or not you know, we have an aggressive enough across-the-board strategy uh, to make sure that we're, protect we're protecting our own potential domestic uh, production capacity here uh, so that it, you know, winds up with Americans with these jobs. Could you expand on that, well, Mr. Well, very Holden? briefly, that's a, I think I said, you know, the next five years I think are very important for the grid parities on solar and wind. And essentially this is when industries are being built right now. And, um, you know, as I said, we feel that uh, U.S. policy lacks TLC at the moment. And therefore, you know, we could see more done. TLC again stands for transparency, longevity, and certainty. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Viswanathan. Yeah. So th this is one of our favorite charts. Uh, you're exactly right. It's it's Moore's law for for photovoltaics. It's the fundamental thesis on which we invest in solar, which is a significant portion of our portfolio. The point I would make is you're exactly right. Basically, we are very close to grid parity. Very close, meaning the next few years. If we have the right incentives, we will get there in the U.S. And we're at that stage when this is where the incentives kick in. It's in the lab. It's going into deployment. If we don't have those incentives, what will happen is you'll have lines coming from all of those points, and they're going to go to different countries, mm -hmm. China, Taiwan, Korea. And that's, that's what's scary. Having said that, this chart, if you show it to our competitors globally, scares them because they cannot come down that, that curve. They can only come, down, come down in certain ways because they fundamentally, that from 1978 to today, it's innovation. And right? that's America. And that's America. This is our innovation. Exactly. These are the breakthroughs made largely in the United States. So here we are, the innovators, creating these huge technological breakthrough historical moments. huh? And the other countries are start, uh, taking note of it, putting in place policies, some of them protectionists, and so that they can capture the opportunity that we created out of our universities. Yeah. And to build on what 
Mr. Fulton said, and also a, a response to Mr. Cleaver's question, the incentives we're not saying is permanent. It's a few years until we get into that orange red yes. band, right? Yes. And then grid parity takes off and you can r you don't need the incentives. Yes. And so that's why I think that's the fundamental tenet that needs to be reinforced over and over exactly. again. Exactly. And by the way, let me just say this. Um, there were huge subsidies that had to be built into the system in order to build an electricity grid in the United States, especially out to rural America. It was subsidized. It was largely subsidized by urban Americans taking care of suburban and rural Americans. In telecommunications, there was a huge subsidy program. So we could have a telecommunications program in the United States. And it was largely subsidized by urban Americans who subsidized suburban and rural Americans so that they could have the same phone service um, that those in the cities had. Huh? But it was a huge multi, multi-billion dollar that still continues to this day, by the way, still continues, the subsidy of urban America, of rural America for, tele for telecommunications, for example. So I think people are kidding themselves if they think there hasn't been an ongoing industrial policy in the United States to ensure that the electricity and the solar, I mean, and the uh, telecommunications revolution um, was not available. Okay? It's, it still exists. It's multi-billions per year. Huh? So then when we turn to this new technology revolution, the crocodile tears come down from, in many instances, the very companies that got subsidized to be created in the same way that the telecommunications companies didn't want a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth license to be put out there. In the same way that the existing companies were saying, why would we want broadband? We already have a monopoly. We already have all the customers that exist in America. Why would we want other independent companies? And uh, hundreds of them moved into the space once we had this broadband revolution. Why would we want those people in as well? So we have to work it through in order to explain to the American people that there are millions of jobs here that we can create in the United States because technology always triumphs. Technology always triumphs. This is going to happen. It's only a question of whether we as a country are going to start out where we're going to be forced to wind up anyway in terms of the importation of these technologies into our country or the, or the development, the creation of the jobs here in the United States that will then export them to other countries in the world. That's the only question. Not whether or not there is a Moore's Law in solar. There is. Are we going to have a plan to capture it here for our country? Uh, Mr. Carboni. Yes, I was just going to say that uh, similar laws were applied in the, in the wind business as well. If you wind the clocks back 30 years, you, you see a similar curve. We took advantage, at least in the early part of uh, this past decade, of the, of the scale that was produced in Europe uh, here in the U.S. in terms of, of bringing that, that the price of wind power through the price of wind turbines, which are the main driver in, that, in, that, uh, in the cost models. Um, By the way, if you have that shot, I'd like to use it as well. If, you've got, we, we if you have a similar chart, chart yeah. to that in wind, uh, I would like to use that as well, just so that people can see the inexorable inevitability of the triumph of technology and whether or not we, rather than being in denial of whether or not this is going to happen, and we understand why the Koch brothers and Tessero and Valero are, okay, but whether or not, you know, uh, Adlai Stevenson, someone said to him, every thinking voter is with you. And, and he said, yeah, but I need a majority, okay? And the way you get a majority, <laughs> the way you need to get a majority is we have hearings like this. We have a big public debate. So to a certain extent, this California referendum is a great opportunity for us as well. Let's have this debate. Let's, let's see where California wants to be, huh? Uh, and let's also, though, show who's on the other side of the debate. Uh, because they're clearly looking at history in a rearview mirror. Mr. Carboni, please continue. Yeah, just to finish, I, th I think uh, uh, it, uh, we fully agree it is technology that uh, that will continue to drive us down that curve. Unfortunately, the wind business, a lot of those same, a lot of the innovations were not born here, uh, but today they, they are. And and my company in particular uh, uh, is taking a different approach with the technology in order to further drive down mm -hmm. the uh, cost of energy. It's just. And it's all technology. But you're saying America is now catching up in innovation in wind. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mr. Levi. Um, so first of all, a couple of examples um, just to confirm that this is not an academic exercise. This is real. Um, Italy is pretty much where at the moment, uh, th this year or next, the cost of solar 
uh, in the sunnier parts in the south of Italy will be parity with the retail price of electricity. So in Italy, you get to the point where if you want to put a s um, uh, an air conditioning unit in, you should generate the electricity from photovoltaic on your own roof. Mm -hmm. uh, California, perhaps a few years, but this is without subsidy. Um, California, perhaps uh, a few years behind, but not far. What is the difference between retail and wholesale price for solar? Well, um, the, the, the price at the moment is, is absolutely accurate on that chart. It's around 22 cents per kilowatt hour. It depends how sunny and so on. Italy has very high daytime electricity costs and, there, and good sun, and therefore it will get there uh, amongst the first locations. Um, obviously, wholesale is different. If you're generating electricity and then putting it into the grid, then you're competing with, um, you know, w with the coal-fired power station or the gas-fired power station, and then you have to get to a, a lower price, which is shown on the chart. So if you're if you're a Texas oil refiner, it's very it's very sunny in Texas. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Uh, it's very sunny at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. It's very sunny in Florida. Or those ads are going to start to run again, where a bad day in Florida in the winter is when one cloud <laughs> goes by. You know. So they advertise all the sun there, and there's a lot more sun there than in Italy or Germany, huh? Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, if you are lower if electricity prices, though. Excuse so me? S well, Italy's going to get there first because of slightly higher daytime electricity prices, right. which also matter. But if you are, you, if you are it's an oil, oil refiner yeah. in Texas that really wants to just continue to bring in oil from OPEC to refine, huh? all that sun in Texas, it's got to be scary every day you go out and you have to put on sun protection and you're an oil refiner in Texas. It's got to be a little bit, uh, you have to be a little bit apprehensive, not it only about your own scary. personal health, but the, no. the health of your future in terms of uh, these uh, competitive industries that you have to go to California to, to slow it down or kill it first uh, before it reaches this epidemic of new energy technologies, reaches uh, Texas in its full-blown uh, market-based uh, form that no longer needs subsidies in five or ten years because you have now created a complete market for it. Do, do you agree with that? Well, it, it should be scary because the combination of solar with electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids is a real large-scale threat to the current way of doing business. Yeah. Uh, and so it should be. I do want to raise one other You are saying that because 70 percent of all of the oil which we consume in America goes into gasoline tanks that these oil refiners have a stake in making sure we don't have a plug-in hybrid and, re and uh, an all-electric vehicle revolution because they could be using solar and wind-generated electricity to power these vehicles and tell OPEC we don't need their oil any more than we need their sand, uh, but that wouldn't require uh, oil to be imported from these countries into uh, uh, refiners in America uh, and reduce our dependence upon imported oil, change our our national security status in terms of where we import this oil from and the funding that we give to these countries and uh, in other countries. So there is a huge national security element that goes to the creation of a domestic renewable energy uh, industry that then is providing the lower cost electricity for the plug-in hybrids and the all electric vehicles that we are using. Indeed. Um, I saw an interview with the Saudi oil minister who was asked about alternative energy and whether he considers the drive towards clean energy as a, as a threat. And his response was to say, no, we are, we are absolutely happy for it to happen because it will never in any way threaten anything we do, essentially. Um, and I just said, uh, thought, well, you know, that is spoken like somebody who hasn't seen the chart and the trends. You would think that a country that is sunny 99 percent of the time, Saudi Arabia, uh, oh, the times that it's not, it's in the middle of the night. And if you ever saw it, you ever see Lawrence of Arabia? And, and poor Lawrence is out there in the middle of the desert. It's very windy okay, in the middle of the night, apparently, over there in Saudi Arabia, out in the desert. So you would think it would be a country that would have some insight into the power of solar and wind. Um, uh, but uh, they continue to finance, in fact, uh, questions about climate change and questions about the need to you know, move in this direction as well, although they could be the leaders, in fact. Uh, in the development of that technology, but they are not unlike their oil refining brethren here in Texas that is going to try to slow down this domestic revolution. C could I, if I may, comment on one other aspect of this global race which this raises, mm -hmm. um, and that is um, there is a caveat around 
how we go for those manufacturing jobs. Yes. Um, and if you go back to the analogy of the telecoms industry, which was an enormously successful industry and created jobs um, through your efforts and the efforts of others uh, in, in creating the frameworks, we do import m almost all of our mobile phones. The manufacturing is not generally domestic US, but the license, the technology, the value add very much uh, is. And we have an analogous situation where those innovations, uh, many of which were here in the US, are embedded in a lot of the technology that's coming out of China and other parts of the world. So I would just urge caution about seeing success as whether we manufacture cells in the US, yes or no, because um, our research shows just how integrated the supply chain, the technology licensing, the financing, the search for talent, managerial talent, and so on, it's very, very integrated. And the number one challenge for this shift to clean energy is to keep going down that curve, which requires all countries to be progressing and playing to their strengths. And so I think particularly given the drumbeat of um, concern about China, about its exchange rate, about its potentially illegal uh, 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 support of its industry, what we mustn't allow to happen is for that to turn into a tit-for-tat trade war in this sector. And so that's my caveat, because it is, it is important that we use their cheap manufacturing where that is appropriate. Now, say, which I think they're trying to say to us, why don't we do this? Why don't we take all of these brilliant innovations that you have in your universities in solar and then allow us with our very low cost um, workforce to manufacture it and together we will save the world. You coming up with the ideas, we with making the products. Uh, and by the way, in order to ensure that that is the case, engage in protectionist activity and subsidies that are questionable under uh, World Trade Organization rules uh, in order to uh, create that uh, beachhead of, of manufacturing capacity in our country uh, that then makes it very difficult for you to compete. So we clearly don't want to be left as Uncle Sucker here, uh, investing in all the research and then not seeing the jobs in America in its fair proportion. Uh, to what it should represent, given the investment that we made as a nation. Do you agree with that, Mr. Lightright? I, I would not disagree with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fulton. There's no reason, and to just build on what you said earlier, just take a page out of the semiconductor industry. The innovation was done here. Intel, some of the greatest companies are here. They've outsourced manufacturing to the fabs in, in China and Taiwan. We have seeded nothing in terms of innovation. All the, the what's going on in cell phones, video, et cetera, a lot of that is emerging. Some's coming from Asia, but a lot of that, the core innovation, still coming from here, and that's resulting in a lot of jobs being created. Yep, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fulton, you, you contributed to a report published earlier this month that looked at the claims made by global warming skeptics regarding the fundamental science of climate change. First of all, why did Deutsche Bank decide to put out that report?
used to being seduced with the next step on the rescue ship if you give her a sign to do so. So uh, to me, it's an absolute necessity to be aware of your presence and not be aware of your presence. And if you have an investment thesis that is wrong, that becomes an investment thesis. So we went to Columbia University as a science community. At least they were scientists, but we know they weren't, who did conduct a relative collapse going on in these arguments. So they were set out in some detail in a 55-page spreadsheet. And we asked, could you give us a test of two, clear reviews, and answers to that? And that's what they did. And we ended up, our conclusion was, we're not scientists, but our conclusion is universal, which is if they can't do the investment thesis, they saw a serious um, threat going up beyond even the uh, emission of the climate change. Um, and... Um and how has that approach to the issue and investment in climate and clean energy technology as a result evolved over the last several years at Deutsche Bank? Well, you know, we've had, uh, we have at the moment uh, $5 billion under management related to climate change themes, and that has gone up and down with the markets. And uh, there's no doubt since the uh, financial market crisis hit, and since the uh, you know volatility, and I'd say the volatility in policy, um, because these are policy-related markets, and that these, these the, you know the the it's been more on hold uh, in terms of not what we're doing, but in terms of investor investor perception. So I think we now are at, again at a very important crossroad. It's not just because at the end of the day, as you you're pointing out, I mean uh, unless investors get behind it, where's that trillions of dollars coming from? So we are looking for, you know, the markets are doing their best. They're innovating. You know, we have a private equity group as well. So we're trying to do our best. Uh, everyone is. But at the end of the day, if unless we have, I'm afraid to go back to this, this TLC structure, then uh, uh, while we're in that scale deployment phase, which we're in for and the TLC next stands for again? Transparency, longevity, and certainty. Okay, good thing. Unless we have that as investors, the cost of capital is going to remain high and the uncertainty is going to remain there, and you won't see the, the adequate flows that you're going to need to really get there. So I think at the moment, uh, a lot of us are saying, okay, let's see how, we s how policy goes in America in particular in the next few months. I think it's a very important signal. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Liebreich, I have a slide that I'd like to put up uh, for a moment. I don't believe that you used this one during your presentation, but I think it's a very interesting one. If we can uh, get it up on the screen here, uh, could you explain briefly what we are um, looking at? Um, I think this is the one that says that U.S. wind manufacturing supply is projected to ramp up to 14,000 to 15,000 megawatts per year over the next uh, couple of years, um, but projected demand falls way short of that. Could you put that um, up on the screen, please? Okay, please. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. Um, so this is output from our uh, wind team. Um, the uh, years up until 2009 are historic. Uh, 2010 is our estimated outturn for this year. There is a downturn this year in wind. There is, a, there is a downturn. Uh, financing activity, uh, we s which um, I showed in the data that I presented in my prepared statement, um, slowed down quite dramatically uh, at the end of 2008 here in the U.S., uh, and into 2009, and of course uh, the the build rate drops away sometime after the financing activity. What we're seeing in the U.S. is that over the longer period uh, from 2005 through till 2008, 2009, was that demand outstripped supply. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, there are only two domestic manufacturers, GE and a smaller company called Clipper. Uh, before Nordic Wind's arrival on the scene, a very welcome development. Um, and um, the demand that built up through uh, the uh, incentives, through the programs that were in place, outstripped that supply, and the supply was partly held back by the lack of what uh, my colleague Mark Fulton would call uh, TLC, the fact that the production 
uh, tax credit for wind expired every two years meant that companies were reluctant to, in uh, the European companies principally, uh, were reluctant to invest here in the US uh, in order to meet that demand because there was so much uncertainty about uh, the use of those assets. Um, what is happening now is that uh, there is substantial new investment and you can see on this chart who's doing the investing. Now you can see GE in dark blue and Clipper at the top uh, in light blue, but the expansion in capacity is coming from Vestas of Denmark, Siemens of Germany, Gamesa of Spain, uh, and Nordex also of Germany. And they're coming to the US and they're building manufacturing or assembly plants. Uh, this is all uh, measured at the end assembly stage. Um, the issue is though that now there is insufficient demand to fill those plants. So we're moving from a situation of under capacity, supply constraint, to overcapacity, which is very good news for the cost of turbines, which are coming down. Uh, we produce the, w the wind turbine price index, and we're seeing turbine prices coming down already by around 20% from their peaks in 2009. Um, so we are going into a period where there's going to be lower level of installations uh, because of the difficulty of financing in the post-crisis environment at the same time as you're saying the you're supply. saying that the the derivatives driven financial meltdown has now had an impact the the, the fact that we didn't regulate derivatives uh, accurately uh, 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 wisely inside of the financial system now has a, a collateral consequence in terms of now receiving financing for something that obviously has seen a reduction in the overall cost of producing uh, this new technology well, I don't think I mentioned derivatives. <laughs> I uh, just want everyone, when you say the catastrophe, we know the catastrophe is that unfortunately around the world people were buying derivatives packed with all kinds of very poor, uh, poorly structured uh, investment vehicles that were not well understood by the global investment communities that unfortunately has come back to haunt all other industries as well. And uh, I'm not sure Tea Party activists fully understand um, that counterparties actually don't have a stake in, in policing the uh, derivatives global marketplace, since the CEOs of most of these companies don't, who pr produce the derivatives don't even understand what a derivative is, except that it was a center of, of uh, economic profit for them. Uh, but um, ultimately, the bubble burst, and it's having an impact in other economic areas as well. I only say that just you know, to yeah. point out, I was the chairman over Wall Street for 14 years as well. So I bring that knowledge in as well as telecom from the 90s just to add it in as an extra factor of what the consequences are of turning a blind eye to things that were completely knowable in terms of the impact that derivatives and subprime mortgages would have upon not only ours but the global economy. So I just throw that in as an editorial comment. Yes, Mr. Leibreich. So um, there was a crisis. There um, was a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> there was a crisis. There was a crisis. Um, and, <laughs> and it did, uh, and it did uh, have a substantial impact on this sector. Yes. Um, and the sector is still suffering from that. Yeah. Uh, if you step away from the various um, uh, support mechanisms, the availability of capital is much reduced. And the cost of capital uh, in, the, in the, the private markets, the debt markets, the equity markets, uh, remains stubbornly high even now two years after. Um, and uh, so that is why there is such a focus on um, programs like the, uh, the cash grants because it is impossible otherwise to get the same level of projects financed. The, some projects will get financed, um, but there is a chunk that will not happen without uh, the continuance of some of these programs here in the US. And what we're seeing here uh, in terms of the dotted line that you see on the chart, which is the line of demand, that is on the assumption that the cash grants uh, continue in place, the Recovery Act cash grants continue in place, we'll see a bad year this year, a drop to six gig gigawatts of, uh, uh, of installation, uh, and then um, bouncing back somewhat, uh, but that bounce back is in jeopardi jeopardy if, the, um, if those grants are not uh, continued. So, so you want a continuation of the, of the grant programs, the loan programs, the, the tax uh, programs that are on the books, and would you, would you also want a, a national renewable electricity standard to be put so on the books so that you have a 
you have a belt and suspenders program uh, where there is a policy that is established combined with then the financing uh, programs that are put in place uh, that help to facilitate the installation of the renewable uh, energy uh, sources that uh, create a much more TLC stands for what again? Transparency, longevity and certainty. Longevity and certainty for the investment uh, community, right? So that is really what we are trying to uh, do here. I have to keep repeating that in English for, you know, because we are going to have a big public debate in the United States and TLC means something completely uh, different than what you mean it to mean. It, it means more the way uh, Aretha Franklin used it in the song Respect, <laughs> okay? So we just sort of TLC just means something else. We sort of hope people might relate to it then. Right. I know they should, but it is the TLC for the renewable energy uh, industry, but it includes the, the grants, the loans, plus the policy that is put in place uh, that creates an environment where they get a lot of TLC, right? Uh, but it has to be continuous, it has to be some longevity, and there has to be some uh, predictability to it. Mr. Liebreich. So um, when you say we would, uh, we want, uh, we are an information provider, um, so we don't um, sort of use that, uh, that approach. Um, but certainly the industry and our clients would be 100 percent behind the push for transparency and longevity. So, Mr. Swanathan, you are a financer. Yes. You do provide the money. Yes. M Mr. Liebreich provides the information. You provide the money. Yes. So uh, lay out for us what you need to see put in place so that we have this uh, more predictable uh, investment climate that uh, leads to uh, the reduction in costs and ultimately the withdrawal of the need to have the yeah. public financing programs be put in place. Certainly. I think uh, exactly what, what you had said, uh, Chairman Markey, uh, we would like a uh, continuation of these programs, 48C, 1603. We would like the 48C also to be re refundable, as Mr. Carboni said, especially given a lot of these innovations are happening in startups that are starved for cash and we need to, to, to incentivize them. I think the loan guarantee program and RPE have been very uh, successful and there's a lot of good coming out of it. We need to, we need to have that in place. We need to have a, uh, a national electricity standard and, l and energy efficiency standard. If you look at some of our peers across the globe, in China they have multiple of these incentives. They have a stimulus for clean energy. They have a renewable energy standard, they have a feed-in tariff, they have an energy development fund. All of these things are going to be very, very helpful as we build that clean tech economy. But your, fir your firm is still putting up billions of dollars yes. in the clean energy sector. Why is that if, uh, if you see all these uh, pessimistic uh, signs on the road as well? Why are you still investing so many well, additional new billions of dollars into the clean energy sector? Well, that is a very good question. The two ways I'd answer is because we fundamentally believe in all the things that you said in terms of your chart. Having said that, if all of these stop, you will see investment dry up from our community because we cannot do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. The scale that is needed is so massive that you will see innovation dollars dry up and then that will have a spiraling effect on, on the actual innovation that's trying to get to market. Okay. Now, uh, could we pull up uh, Mr. Liebreich's uh, Slide number seven, please. Uh, slide number nine, please, uh, so that we could uh, have a little bit of discussion about that. So this is uh, VC new investment in clean energy sector, uh, in clean energy by sector, the top fifteen, uh, the top fifteen uh, countries, and the United States is in the lead, uh, looking over its shoulder at number two, three, four, five, and six in the world. Huh? So uh, that's a reason to be optimistic. Uh, Mr. Carboni, could you take a look at that chart and tell us why that is happening and, and are you optimistic that it could continue? Yeah, while Michael provides the information and Ravi provides the money, we, we initially consume the money, but we hope to make the money okay, uh, great. Uh, as, as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I would have to say that, uh, and you showed in your chart as well, that this money is, for the most part, uh, uh, financing innovation and technology development. Um, and a lot of those uh, st early stage startup companies are actually starting here right. in the U.S. And, and I actually am, our company is one of them. And Mr. Viswanathan is actually one of the investors in, uh, in our company uh, uh, as well. Um, we have, in, we're initially were invested by uh, U.K. and, Euro and uh, European based investors. And just recently in the rounds of financing that we did late last year, 
we're able to attract investment from uh, from the U.S. community and actually establish ourselves here uh, in the U.S. Um, so we are part of that uh, somewhere, small part, but a part of that top bar on this uh, on this chart. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Liebreich, thank you so much for providing these great. Um, graphs. It is very, very important for us to understand it. Mr. F uh, Mr. Fulton, last month your colleague at Deutsche Bank, Kevin Parker, was quoted in a Reuters article. Here is what he said. There is sleep at the wheel on climate change, a sleep at the wheel on job growth, a sleep at the wheel on this industrial revolution taking place in the energy industry. You just throw up your hands and say, we are going to take our money elsewhere. Now, this is your company's uh, head of uh, global, the global head of asset management. Uh, can you give us some context here, what Mr. Parker was talking about? This is testimony ultimately before the United States uh, Senate as they were trying to pass a, a climate and clean energy bill uh, that ultimately was stopped by, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it's basically um, the, sen the oil senators from Oklahoma and the coal senators from Kentucky, that, uh, the Republicans, that basically just stop it over there. So, you know, again, we continue to have this tension that exists. Could you talk a little bit about what Mr. Parker was making reference to? Well, I can't talk for him directly, but I think, you know, as I understand it, uh, what we're saying, that w what he's saying, and w what I believe, is that it's very simple. Uh, the U.S. Congress has not uh, passed anything this year, and it's been an important year. So that's that's just a fact. So we don't have a climate or energy bill coming out. Um, into law, so you know that, th as I say, that that's just fact. Uh, in terms of uh, capital deployment, again, I think the point is that it, I think it's particularly in the longer term. Where is capital going to go in the next five to ten years? And unless the United States has this policy package and structure that's going to encourage that flow, I it's not going to take place. It's not going to take place. Now, I understand that. None of you are international trade lawyers, uh, but I would like to get your views on the United Steel Workers' petition to the U.S. Trade Representative regarding China's violations of trade rules in the clean energy sector. As I mentioned in my testimony, I believe that we very much need a climate of intense Darwinian paranoia inducing competition in the renewable energy sector. Uh, uh, so that we can drive down the cost of each of these technologies as quickly as possible. But if China is violating international trade laws, our domestic workers and domestic industry as a whole is put at an obvious disadvantage. I would like to ask each of you how important this issue is in terms of leveling up the playing field uh, so that all countries feel that they have a stake uh, in uh, in uh, in this competition uh, to create a manufacturing sector that, uh, that induces the paranoia that lowers the cost uh, for production as quickly as possible. Mr. Fulton and right across, and uh, well, you can each disclaim any knowledge as an international indeed, trade lawyer. Yes, yes, indeed I do disclaim any knowledge yes. of international <laughs> trade law and obviously would make the point that we have to wait and see you know, what is determined in that situation. Um, I would make one comment about China's policy. It is very comprehensive. It, it, we have heard this from other, from other participants. They are tackling this issue at many, many levels. And um, you know, we even note that they have been talking about looking at carbon markets domestically in China. So one thing I would say is that um, I think sometimes uh, people have said, well, the Chinese may not be doing anything. Well, the Chinese are certainly taking action here. The question is, you know, if it happens to be uh, contributing WTO, which I don't know, then that's up to the WTO. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carboni. Yes, I, I, my knowledge on the situation is entirely uh, what it what it should be, what you'd like to have. But um, I think there is a relationship. We discussed some of it here earlier between technology development, manufacturing, the financing of it, and the, and the deployment of it. And I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't educated myself enough to, to really to, to really understand what the U.S. Steelworks are trying to accomplish, and uh, in, in what in particular technologies that they're really trying to uh, to tackle here. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. Vishwanathan? Yeah, I, I uh, would build on what you said about level the playing field, and that's what this whole discussion has been. A lot of it has been around incentives and, and spurring uh, that innovation. But the flip side of that is making sure that we have policies where if there's trade violations, we figure out what it is and make sure that there's policies such that globally no country can arbitrage a system to get away with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Liebreich? Uh, again, I will make the caveat that I'm not an international trade lawyer, um, but on the economics of it, um, I think that, um, first of all, the big uh, opportunity for U.S. wind turbine manufacturers is not exporting to China. Uh, and l likewise, I suspect that Chinese manufacturers are going to find it easier to, to export to some of the other uh, markets um, where their technology might be more appropriate. So their technology is not as um, productive, as it does the yields are not as high, uh, and so on. So um, I, I was recently in Brazil and came across a number of representatives of Chinese wind turbine manufacturers. So the battle between U.S. wind technology and Chinese wind technology might well be happening elsewhere in the world. Um, I think in terms of the case, if you look at uh, some of those elements, it will be very difficult to, without knowing, uh, without claiming to be a lawyer, very difficult to prevail in terms of cheap loans and so on. Uh, it's hard to distinguish some of those programs from some of the programs here. One element of what China is doing gives me great cause for economic concern, mm -hmm. and that is um, anything to do with restricting the export of rare earth minerals mm -hmm. has to achieve a different status of attention, mm -hmm. I believe, from all of the normal trade law uh, and trade, um, uh, you know, the, t the, the tit for tat and the, and the to and fro around trade. We can deal with that through WTO. Rare earth minerals are different because there are no other substantial sources on this planet that have been developed, that have been found and, and exploited outside and of developed China. outside China. So which, which minerals are you referring so to? So we're talking about some of the uh, exotic dysprosium and some of the exotic mm -hmm. um, uh, doping minerals that you need to make permanent magnets um, in some of the solar technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the permanent magnets, sorry, go into the most advanced um, sorts of wind turbines um, to reduce their weight and, and increase their power th uh, outputs. These are essential technologies also around the smart grid. Um, we're not going to have a smart grid without rare earth uh, minerals. And so I think that we should be um, prioritizing ensuring that there is a global and open market for these minerals, perhaps over some of the uh, more eye-catching issues mm -hmm. around um, cheap loans where one can get into a, an argument about who's doing what to whom uh, and, and take our eye off the ball. Okay. So you're saying that we need to ensure the raw materials are there so that other countries have the capacity to, uh, to participate in this global competition because the denial of access to the rare materials makes it impossible, really, for a level playing field to be created. Indeed, if we cannot, um, if the manufacturers in the rest of the world can't have access to the rare earth minerals or their the products that they go into, the magnets and so on, then it's uh, it's going to be put those countries at a very very substantial disadvantage. Yeah, the, the Department of Energy is actually considering loan guarantees for U.S. rare earth production, which is something that I also think is very important that we begin to recognize that as something that should be specially focused upon in terms of rare earth minerals here in the United States and the extent to which we are also financing that development as well. Um, Mr. Liebreich, what, could you put the Recovery Act in context for us a little bit? How important was that legislation last February of 2009 and making sure that we did not see a precipitous drop off, uh, almost uh, you know, catastrophic in terms of the deployment of wind and solar and geothermal and biomass technologies in the United States? Well, there's, there's two parts to that answer. The, the, uh, the big uh, part of the answer is that it played a very substantial role. And um, had that act not been passed, we would not see the level of installations and therefore the level of, and also the level of factory uh, openings and, and job creation that we're seeing now. The caveat, the small part of the answer is that there was actually um, a period where the industry was actually waiting because they were waiting for that act to be first passed and then for it to be clarified and so on. Mm -hmm. So the stimulus 
for a period acted as an anti-stimulus. And I say that only for the, because we're through that period, um, and, and I say it only for the record that it, it was actually a difficult period. We saw uh, the end of 2008, beginning of uh, 2009, a drop that's perhaps more precipitous as companies waited to see whether they would qualify what the detailed rules would be. But what uh, did it mean for you, Mr. Carboni, that the stimulus bill passed? Little this year. But a lot next year. A lot so next year. Yeah. So it's yeah. given you an investment uh, climate. Th up at the TLC, we're looking for that certainty. TLC so stands for? Transparency, longevity, and certainty. And certainty. Not some of that you get. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Um, and let me just finally then move to this uh, question of, uh, of the renewable. I, I, we have to live here in Congress in an acronym free world. <laughs> Um, because we're trying to talk to all of these people that Mr. Liebreich says that if they get all the information, you know, in a digestible form, they'll make the right decision. But part of our responsibility is to be the translators, you know, out of the world of the experts. There is no such thing as a congressional expert, you know, compared to real experts. You know, it's an oxymoron, you know, like jumbo shrimp or Salt Lake City nightlife. I mean, there is no such thing as a congressional <laughs> expert, except to the extent to which we help to translate it into English uh, and, and other languages spoken in the United States that uh, help to um, ensure that voters understand, you know, what exactly is at stake. So, um, in terms of a renewable electricity standard, um, uh, in, uh, how important do each of you believe that is uh, for a long-term? TLC uh, for all of these technologies that you are talking about. We'll go with you first, Mr. Liebreich. Uh, so I think a an aggressive renewable electricity standard, in terms of its ambition, yes. and also in terms of its penalties for non-achievement, um, could be the single most important long-term factor in the development of the market here in the U.S. But I do say that it has to be ambitious, not something that is easily achieved. Mm -hmm. The good things in life tend to be hard to achieve. Uh, and if it doesn't spur changes in investment practices and so on, then it's not, uh, it's not gonna be substantial. Um, so ambitious in scale and with penalties that are meaningful, in other words, that the, uh, the various um, companies, utilities, can't simply pay the penalty and go on with business as usual. Mm -hmm. that in place over a long period, setting a long-term uh, target would be very important. The single critical thing that has to happen, whether it's through a feed-in tariff, whether it's through a, a portfolio standard, whether it's through any other mechanism, is that it, it has to create demand. We are not going to win this simply by working on the supply side. Uh, we've got to have demand so that the companies that are being financed and that are producing the technologies know that they'll be able to sell and get revenues here in the US. Not just that it'll be cheap to open a factory, but that there's something to s somebody to sell uh, the products from. Um, so I think it is critically important. Mm -hmm. um, the states have shown great leadership in moving ahead um, with their own renewable energy standards. As I mentioned, 30 states have got some sort of standard. And a national standard which builds on that, which goes beyond that, would be very, very helpful. Well, as you know, or maybe I'm going to inform you of this, I but on, I on yeah. June 26, 2009, inside of the Waxman Markey bill um, was language, my language actually, that <laughs> created a 15 percent <laughs> renewable electricity standard by the year 2020 in the United States for all 50 states, not for 30 states. Uh, and another 5 percent that would have to be extracted by the utilities and new energy efficiencies in the way in which they generate electricity. So that would be 20 percent by 2020. Would that meet your standard for challenging the system, Mr. Liebreich? It would, it would most certainly help. There's no question. Uh, my own view is that if you look at those cost curves, um, it's, it, one should err on the side of being aggressive uh, and ambitious. No, so what I'm saying to you is um, if, if we're all right, and that curve is just going to continue. Adding in 20 more states, setting that goal, we'll probably beat that anyway just because of the market that we open up. Huh? So that while you're right, we should, AT&T testified before Congress in 1981 that one million people would have cell phones in the United States in the year 
No, 2,000, 1 million. Big goal for AT&T as a monopoly, huh? Yeah. Uh, but uh, as I was moving over the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, you know, uh, spectrum license, um, I wasn't going to predict that everyone would have two devices in their pocket by 2010, you know, uh, and that uh, children would have their own uh, little devices as well that they could be uh, walking around with. But I kind of have confidence that technology ultimately triumphs, and once you set this larger goal, actually it will probably be exceeded as long as you set something that was reasonable, huh? that uh, people will go over it. And that, anyway, that is just the way I view it, given my experience in the cable, satellite, and telecom uh, sector. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that is what will happen if we can get something passed. Do you agree with that, Dr. Well, Riswanathan? I agree very much with that. Thir as, as Mr. Fulton said, 30 states have it now, but those policies are in danger unless the federal government adopts a national standard. So I'm very much in favor of that. Yeah, they're, they're in danger, of course, because oil refiners from Texas are going to, if they win in California, they're going to state by state. Exactly. And, uh, and they'll, they'll be on a path of destruction for a renewable energy uh, policy being in place in those states. I mean, that's no question about it. So we have to win in California. Uh, Mr. Carboni. Number one on my list, uh, Congressman. It it, uh, and I'm not sure I would argue whether it should be 15 percent or 17 percent or 18 percent. I think it should be now. It, it really should be now. And then we could get ourselves out of production tax credits, investment tax credits, and all of these things as we get the incentive to scale. It's more important that we do it now. Thank you. I'm with you. Uh, Mr. Fulton. Yes. Well, I particularly um, echo Michael's point that uh, it should be ambitious. And if you really want to, if, if it's going to stand alone, it has to have enforcement and penalty on it. Um, or else, again, you need this whole structure underneath it of incentives. So you can do it. You can do it in different formats. The other point I'd make is that at a technical level, um, a national uh, rec market, renewable energy credit market, is probably more efficient than a pure state-based one. So it has actually a technical side to it when you go and talk to the guys that are actually trading these recs. They actually like a national standard. Thank you. And here is the perverse position that we are in. The Edison Electric Institute signed off on that standard in that bill in, uh, 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 on June uh, 26, 2009. So that is where American public policy is right now, trapped over in the Senate with a minority of senators coming from and representing the perspective of oil and coal from Kentucky and Oklahoma kind of denying the rest of the country this revolution while we were still funding in that bill, by the way, $60 billion for carbon capture and sequestration, uh, research, development, and deployment, $60 billion in the bill so that the older industries could move along as well as part of this clean energy revolution. So it wasn't as though you know it was just all one side. It was going to be a comprehensive all of the above strategy. So we are going to wrap, wrap up the hearing right here, and we are going to ask each one of you to give us the one minute you want uh, the American public to remember from uh, your presentation. And as we go forward on this clean energy debate here in the United States, we are going to go in reverse order of the uh, original uh, testimony so that uh, uh, you can uh, each give us uh, your uh, summary. So we will begin with you, uh, Mr. Fulton. Again, if you could move over that microphone. Uh, we would very much appreciate it. So again, no, we would say that creating transparency, longevity, and certainty in policy structures is crucial to creating a new clean and green energy sector which will stand the United States in great stead in the long run. And in doing that, at the moment, there is a lot of discussion about national renewable, en renewable electricity standards, about extending the incentives coming out of the stimulus package, and all of these should be looked at very carefully at the moment because this is a critical moment. We have to, the United States needs to get on the job in the next five years. This is when the cost curves are falling. This is when the manufacturing and the industries are being created. Thank you. Mr. Carboni. Yes, thank you. Um, look, we, we are an early stage uh, company, and um, uh, we will require some support. We have uh, very supportive customers and investors. Uh, but support in, in way of real near-term uh, cash-based incentives like a refundable uh, 48C tax, uh, manufacturer's tax credit or cash grant in lieu of taxes for our customers are near-term uh, benefits that will support an early-stage company. Long-term, renewable electri electricity standard is really something. It is a market signal that will absolutely benefit us. We, we encourage uh, 
your bill, the Senate to get on, and the President to get on with that this year. Thank you, Mr. Carboni. Uh, Dr. Viswanathan. So my firm invests in innovation, and uh, that has been the hallmark of the United States for decades, and it has led to the creation of massive industries resulting in millions of jobs. That has spilled over into clean tech, uh, which we are very excited about. Having said that, we risk losing that competitiveness based on the commitment and resolve uh, of a lot of the global players, particularly in Asia. To stem that tide, we absolutely need to have some of these policies that we have discussed. And to your words, uh, Chair Markey, I would use all, all of the above. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Liebreich. So I would like to highlight uh, that the world is undertaking this shift to a lower carbon energy future. This is not something that is debatable. This is something that is happening, maybe in the earlier stages, but it is happening. That shift will be enormously profound. It will echo not just through the energy industry, but through the sorts of housing, the sorts of transportation. All industries will be impacted by the shift to lower carbon energy. Uh, and in so doing, it will create an enormous wealth of new technologies, a wealth of new jobs, and a wealth of new wealth. Uh, and I think that the U.S. is at a pivotal point where it has to decide whether it's going to be a price taker for the next century on energy or whether it's going to be a price giver, whether it's going to be leading that revolution or accepting the technologies uh, from other players. Uh, that's what is at stake. And then finally, um, I would also like to highlight the importance of what's happening for investors. And by investors, I don't just mean investment banks or asset management companies. I mean every American who has a 401k or who's saving. Uh, and that is that if you see what is happening in the world in terms of the trends in clean energy, then inevitably you conclude that it is riskier to invest in fossil fuels than it is to invest in clean energy. The perception still is the other way around, but the perception is incorrect. Thank you, Mr. Lieberg, and thank each of you for your very important testimony, uh, because we are at a critical juncture uh, in this clean energy uh, debate. Um, for the last several years, the opponents of dealing with climate change have said, well, what is China going to do? We shouldn't do anything until China moves. Well, China is moving. <laughs> China has targeted this sector. China has a plan. The United States needs a plan. When the United States has a plan, the United States wins. If the United States does not have a plan, we are going to lose. We, that chart will have China, Germany, India, country after country ahead of us in terms of capturing the full economic benefits of this clean energy revolution. So we really don't have a choice. To use this analogy, uh, that is the telecommunications sector, the United States government had to invest in DARPAnet. We had to put up the money initially. When Al Gore was talking about the Internet, we actually had to pass a bill here in Congress in 1991 to take DARPAnet and to turn it into the Internet. That is what he was talking about. It was privatized, but it was a, a public sector investment to create it, not only here but globally. It was a plan which the United States had. And because we had a plan and because we then uh, privatized it in 1991, we were able to capture the lion's share of the benefits. Uh, as long as we then, in 92, 93, and 96, passed the accompanying legislation to ensure it was deployed here in the United States more rapidly, more quickly than in other parts of the world, because then the development of the ancillary ideas would be here as well. We need a similar plan here in uh, the energy sector. Uh, the rest of the world is moving. If America put a plan in place, which is what the Waxman-Markey bill was, a green energy bank, a renewable electricity standard, a 50 percent improvement in the efficiency of all new buildings by 2016, dramatic increase in the appliance efficiency standards in our country. It would incentivize our own country to make the breakthroughs. Sixty billion dollars in carbon capture and sequestration for research, development and deployment. We would be the leader 
we would be exporting. We would be the price maker, not the price taker. We would be telling the rest of the world, here it is. You, know, you want it? Let's have a negotiation over how we share it with you. Instead, we are now confronted with real plans, some of them borderline legal, that are being put, in, being put in place in other countries so that they are able to get the lion's share. So I agree with all of you. We need a national renewable electricity standard. We have to put on the books on a permanent basis these incentives, the tax, the loan, uh, the uh, other uh, programs, so that over a period of time we create the industries, then we can pull away the incentives because they have reached grid parity. Then they don't need the government anymore. They are off and running, and our private sector has been the winner. So in the same way that we deployed telephone service across America, we deployed electricity service across the country, we invested in the Internet in the early years with government money, you can then pull away. You don't have to do it any longer because those people who want to be billionaires and millionaires move in and they are going to move a lot faster uh, than the government would ever move. Whoever makes that breakthrough in photovoltaic will become the wealthiest person on the planet. They will dwarf Bill Gates. They will dwarf other billionaires. That is a lot of electricity for people around the planet. It is a race to be the wealthiest person on the planet. We have to have a strategy so that the names sound like they come from the United States. Huh? That is our goal. Some of them are sitting at this table, you know, and that is who they want to be, the people who ultimately, from the planning, from the financing, then make this stuff and get rich. Huh? That is what uh, it should be all about. And right now, my goal, Henry Waxman's goal, Nancy Pelosi's goal was to create a whole new generation of millionaires and billionaires in our country. And what we are going to need is the venture capital, the banking industry, the technology sector to get into this fight. They have to get on the playing field. We cannot have Texas oil refineries you know, defining a fight. We need these other industries that are the beneficiaries. We need the future billionaires to get into this, huh? the people who believe in the technology sector uh, so that we have a level playing field politically uh, because we are quite confident that our vision is correct. And let me just say again, it is not that we leave behind coal, that we leave behind oil because we make the investment in them as well to ensure that they become a cleaner uh, 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 set of uh, technologies as well. We need all of the above. That is what our plan has to be, and then America will win, looking over its shoulder at number two and three in the world. Thank you all so, so much for your participation here today. And uh, I have a report and a letter on clean energy investment prepared by the accounting firm of Ernst & Young that I would like to put into the record without objection. Uh, and uh, uh, hearing no objection, it will be in the record. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you all so, so much. I look forward to that beer. Um, is this a sponsor? Yeah. Let me just get this. Sounds good.